my topic today is cholesterol, which is probably one of the most controversial topics in the low-carb keto world. Uh, and just a bit of a disclaimer, just to repeat what Lucy said, none of what I'm saying is should be interpreted as personal medical advice. I think it's really important for everybody, before you make a decision about your health care, that you ensure that you've got all of the information in front of you that you need to make an informed decision and that you also have a conversation with your health care provider. So cholesterol. Cholesterol is a fat and it is essential for our existence. Without cholesterol, we wouldn't exist. It's also been around for a very long period of time. Cholesterol was first, has first been isolated from this particular fossil, which is Dickinsonia, and these fossils are from 550 million years ago. So cholesterol has been around for a very long time. So Dickinsonia is thought to be one of the first examples of animals in our evolutionary history. And cholesterol was thought to be important from a couple of points of view. Firstly, in the ability of single cell organisms to become multiple cell organisms, and also in the ability of a species to be able to tolerate the increasing oxygen concentration in the environment. So cholesterol's got a large number of really important functions. So firstly, it's vital for both the structure and function of the cell membrane. So the cell membrane consists of a lipid raft, which has got both phospholipids, and also cholesterol, and the cholesterol are the orange things in that <coughs> diagram. It's also vital for brain health. It's so vital that 25% of your entire volume of cholesterol is contained in your central nervous system. And it's also important, so important that several brain cells have the capacity to uh, manufacture their own cholesterol to ensure that they've got access to cholesterol all of the time. So cholesterol is a precursor for vitamin D production. So cholesterol in the skin is activated by ultraviolet light from sunshine, and this gets converted into vitamin D. It's also the precursor for a number of important hormones. So firstly, cholesterol in the adrenal glands produce cortisol, or the stress hormone. Uh, cholesterol in the ovaries leads to the production of both estrogen and progesterone, but also testosterone and cholesterol in the testes leads to the production of testosterone. Cholesterol is also important for the production of bile acids. So bile acids are produced in the liver and secreted down the bile ducts into the gallbladder uh, where they are stored with as bile. When food is eaten, particularly fatty food, the gallbladder contracts and secretes bile into the upper small intestine. And bile enables uh, both fats and fat-soluble vitamins to be absorbed. Another really important fat that I'm going to talk about is triglycerides. So a triglyceride is the form in which fat is both transported around in the body and also stored in the body. And triglycerides consist of a glycerol backbone with three attached fats or fatty acids. So fat doesn't dissolve in water and fat doesn't dissolve in blood either. And you can imagine if you get some olive oil and pour it into a glass of water, all you get is these blobs of fat. And obviously that wouldn't function particularly well if you had blobs of flat fat floating around in your circulation. So fats are transported around in your body in these things called lipoproteins or fat proteins. So lipoproteins are made mostly in the liver, but they're also made in other areas of your body. So for example, the upper small intestine makes lipoproteins. And lipoproteins have an outer coating, again, which is consists of lipids, uh, both phospholipids and cholesterol. Also on the outer coating is a protein, which enables the body to recognise what lipoprotein this, this particular lipoprotein is. Um, and on the inside, it contains triglycerides and cholesterol. So lipoproteins are involved in transporting fats around in the body. And I'd like you to imagine that you've ordered something online um, and there is a delivery truck that comes to deliver your goods and then later on you've wanted to return something and you've, there's a return van that comes and picks up whatever it is you've ordered. So low density lipoprotein is the delivery van. So low density lipoprotein is manufactured in the liver and secreted out into the circulation. And it starts its life off as a VLDL or very low density lipoprotein. It offloads lots of fat, it becomes a smaller, more dense particle and becomes mid density lipoprotein. Again, it offloads some fat, 
it becomes a smaller, more denser, denser particle and becomes LDL. And that process con continues with offloading of cholesterol and triglyceride. The LDL particle becomes smaller and smaller and denser and denser and ultimately it goes back to the liver. There's a receptor on the liver that recognises it and it gets taken up in the liver and it's recycled. So the protein associated with LDL cholesterol is called apoprotein B100 or ApoB, and some of you might have heard of that term. So HDL is the returns van. So HDL is involved in picking up unwanted fats, both cholesterol and triglyceride from the body, and returning them to the liver. So LDL, uh, HDL comes out of the liver as quite a small particle, and again, as it collects cholesterol and fats from uh, parts of the body that don't want them anymore, it gets larger and larger. Ultimately, it goes back to the liver. It's recognised by a receptor on the surface of the liver, and it get ta gets taken back up and recycled. And the protein on uh, HDL cholesterol is called apoprotein A1. Lipoproteins are also essential for our existence and have another, a number of very essential functions. Firstly, all of fat-soluble vitamins are transported around in lipoproteins. So vitamins A, D, E and K are all transported around the body in lipoproteins. Lipoproteins are also essential for our immunity. Lipoproteins act together with white cells to fight infections with bacteria and with viruses. Lipoproteins are also involved in the transport of antioxidants all around the body, particularly coenzyme Q10 and beta-carotene. And finally, lipoproteins are essential for cell repair. So let's talk about lipoproteins and the risk of having a heart attack or a myocardial infarction. So this is a really large study of uh, 380,000 people, and all these people resided in the UK, and they were followed for an average of 12 years. And on the upright axis, you can see HR, or the hazard ratio of having a heart attack. And on the um, horizontal axis, you can see the LDL cholesterol. And you can see that um, the risk of having a heart attack is, stays pretty stable until you hit a cholesterol of about five, and then the risk of having a heart attack increases. So high LDL cholesterol seems to be associated with an increased risk of heart attack. If we look at HDL, the story is a little different. So you can see that the risk of um, having a heart attack is highest with a very high HDL. And this is uh, so until you reach a HDL of about 2. And then from 2 onwards, the risk stays about the same. So a HDL cholesterol under 2 is associated with increased risk of heart attack. So this is pretty much what is taught to medical students uh, and what is considered by most doctors and cardiologists around Australia and around the world as gospel truth. So LDL increases your risk of heart attack, so LDL is called bad cholesterol, and HDL decreases your risk of having a heart attack, so HDL is good cholesterol, and therefore what we should do is drive LDL as low as we possibly can and HDL as high as we possibly can. And in fact, this is so cemented in the psyche of modern medicine that most recent articles, review articles about LDL, will say that LDL is the cause of heart attacks or is the cause of coronary heart disease. But it's not that simple. So if we look at studies um, of patients who present with a heart attack, so this is a study of 136,000 patients presenting with a heart attack, and what you see on the upright axis is the percentage of patients and on the horizontal axis is the percentage of patients with various different levels of cholesterol. So we're going from the lowest cholesterol up to the highest cholesterol. Now these are in US figures, but if we have a look at what the target cholesterol in, is in Australia, which is a LDL cholesterol of less than 2.5, you can see that 50% of people who present with a heart attack have in fact a normal LDL. And the guidelines in 2009 actually placed the target at less than 3.5 millimoles of cholesterol. And if we look at the 2009 target, actually 75% of people who present with a heart attack have got a normal LDL. Now, if LDL causes heart attacks, how does this actually make any sense? Because there are some people who've got very low LDLs who are still having heart attacks. Let's have a look at lipoproteins and the risk of mortality. Now, this is from the same study of 380,000 people followed for 12 years, looking at the risk of dying associated with the various LDL patterns. And again, we've got LDL cholesterol, hazard ratio of dying, 
um, the baseline ratio of dying is, is indicated by the dotted line. And you can see that a cholesterol under of about 3.5 is associated with increased risk of dying. So if you've got a very low LDL cholesterol, you've got twice the risk of dying as someone with a cholesterol of 3.5. And this bottoms, bottoms out at about four to five, but by the time you reach about seven, the risk of dying increases. And if we have a look at HDL, we've got a similar U-shaped curve in that we know that low HDL is associated with increased risk of heart attack, and you can see there's an ris increased risk of mortality with low HDL. But you can see that once HDL hits two, that the risk of mortality increases. So there is a consistent U-shaped association between both LDL and HDL and mortality. Um, and this, is, this study has been repeated multiple times throughout a number of studies. There is a clear U-shaped association between LDL and mortality. So the, the concept that we should push LDL as low as we possibly can actually doesn't make any sense in the context of the risk of mortality. So let's return to the lipoproteins. So we're going to return to LDL, so the delivery van. So what happens if your delivery van is delivering its goods and has a front end collision and gets com completely damaged, so the front end of it's distorted? Well, what happens is when it gets back to the liver, the receptor on the liver is not going to recognise it because it's so distorted and it won't be able to recycle in the liver. And this is what happens with some LDL. The LDL gets damaged, and when it goes back to the liver, the liver doesn't recognise it, and it gets caught out in the in, in their circulation. And this is called small, dense LDL. So there's three separate processes which damage LDL. The first one of these is glycation. So any condition that increases blood sugar, so insulin resistance, metabolic syndrome, type 2 diabetes, increases blood sugar. Sugar is, or glucose is really quite sticky and it sticks to the LDL and damages it, so the liver doesn't recognise it. The second process is oxidation, and there are two classic examples of oxidation. One is uh, seed oils, as mentioned by James. Seed oils um, oxidise LDL and damage it, so the liver doesn't recognise it. And secondly, cigarette smoking. So everybody knows cigarette smoking doubles your risk of having a heart attack, and cigarette smoking causes oxidation of LDL. And finally, inflammation. Inflammation is another potent cause of damage to LDL. So we know, for example, that if you have rheumatoid arthritis, your risk of having a heart attack is doubled, and that is because the systemic inflammation damages LDL. So um, on the, you can see the, we've got the normal LDL um, on the left-hand side of the screen. We call that large buoyant or large fluffy LDL. And over on the right-hand side, we've got this small dense LDL. And unfortunately, once the LDL is trapped out in the system, it's exposed to even more damage. So it's stuck out in the system, so it's more likely to get further glycation, further oxidation, further inflammation. And we believe that it's the small dense LDL which ends up in arteries and causes heart attacks. So if we have a look at the risk of um, having a heart attack and small dense LDL, uh, this is a study of about um, 11,000 people. Um, and um, on the upright axis, you've got the cumulative incidence of having a heart attack, and on the uh, horizontal axis, you've got the n number of years of follow-up. So we've got five years, sorry, 15 years of follow-up. And then we've got the, the, the different levels of small dense LDL, and they've divided into four. So the lowest small dense LDL level is in the blue, and the highest is in the yellow. And you can see that the higher your small dense LDL, the more likely you are to have a heart attack. If we, however, we have a look at large buoyant LDL, so on the right hand side we've got large buoyant LDL, and you can see they've divided that into four lines as well, but all of the lines are the same because it doesn't matter what your large buoyant LDL is, it makes no difference at all to your risk of having a heart attack. So we can measure small dense LDL by doing something called a lipid subfraction test. This is available in Australia. Um, it's not on the MBS, costs about $130, but any GP can order a lipid subfraction test. And what it does is it divides out all of the lipoproteins on the basis of their density. So if we have a look on the left-hand side here, we've got very low-density lipoprotein, we have mid-density lipoprotein. On the far right-hand side, we've got high-density lipoprotein, so we'll ignore all of those. But just look in the middle, we've got LDL, and there's seven different LDL particle sizes. So on the far left-hand side is LDL1 and 2. These are large buoyant LDL particles. Um, and you can see this person has a significant quantity of those. But they've also got LDL3 and 4. 
uh, which are indicated in red, which is very useful because it tells us it's not a good thing. Um, and this person's got lots of small dense LDL. So one of the ways they put together that whole picture is they work out what the average particle size is. Now clearly you want lots of large point LDL, so you want your particle size to be big. Um, and in this instance, this person's got small particle size. They've got a, a, a particle size which is considered to be a, a type a B risk, which is an increased risk of coronary artery disease. So just moving on a little bit, I want to talk to you about the other known risk factors for uh, coronary heart disease. And this is from the Women's Health Initiative study, which was a really long study of uh, 48,000 patients over 21 years. Uh, and these, these were all postmenopausal women looking at the risk of heart disease associated with various diagnoses. So at the top, you've got type 2 diabetes increases the risk of uh, coronary heart disease by 10.7 fold. So it's enormous. Secondly, we've got lipoprotein insulin resistance, which is the presence of small dense LDL and increases the risk by 6.4 fold. With next, we've got metabolic syndrome or insulin resistance six fold. Hypertension, a significant proportion of which is associated with insulin resistance, is 4.6 fold. Obesity, often associated with insulin resistance, 4.3 fold. And triglycerides, uh, which is associated with insulin resistance 2.1 fold. So we look at the top six, six uh, associations with increased risk of coronary artery disease. They are all related to, to disturbed glucose metabolism, insulin resistance or type 2 diabetes. Right down the bottom, you can see that LDL cholesterol increases the risk by 1.4 fold. So you may ask, why is it that our entire focus on preventing heart attacks in this country centres around reducing LDL? Well, it's probably got something to do with the fact that drugs that lower LDL net the pharmaceutical industry about a trillion dollars a year. So what happens when you restrict carbohydrates? So a low carbohydrate diet or a ketogenic diet, most of your cardiovascular risk factors improve. So diabetes, we improve the control of diabetes and in some instances we reverse diabetes or put it into remission. We improve metabolic syndrome, decrease weight, decrease blood pressure, decrease triglycerides, we decrease small dense LDL, we decrease inflammation. So all fantastic, all decrease risk factors for coronary artery disease. Um, HDL is increased on a low carbohydrate or ketogenic diet and we know again that low HDL is associated with coronary artery disease. So all of these risk factors for coronary artery disease are improved on a low carbohydrate diet. But LDL is a bit of an outlier. So LDL can stay the same, it can go up or it can go down. And a certain group of patients who are particularly lean and fit individuals, their LDL can go up very dramatically. So that's a lot of information. I apologise it's a lot of information in a short period of time, but I wanted to put it together as a case study. So I'd like to introduce you to Kate. So Kate's 64 years of age, and she came to see us at Low Carb Keto Health because she'd just been diagnosed with diabetes, and she didn't want to have diabetes. So her history included uh, hypertension, she had high blood pressure, and she was on two blood pressure medications. Her GP had just started her on metformin for her diabetes. She had uh, fatty liver disease, and she had a high triglyceride. So we worked with her for six months, and she did extremely well. So she reversed her diabetes, we stopped her metformin. Her blood pressure decreased, we stopped her blood pressure medications. She lost 11 kilos in weight, she dropped 10, 10 centimetres around her waist. Um, her HDL went up, fantastic. Her triglyceride went down, that's great. Her liver function was now normal, so she didn't have fatty liver disease anymore. But her total cholesterol went up 6.9 from 5, and her LDL cholesterol went up to 4.7 from 2.5. So Kate got a call from her GP, who got a copy of these results, and she was asked to come in to see her GP, and her GP sat down with her and said, oh my God, what are you doing? Why are you on this crazy fad diet? You are killing yourself. Look at your cholesterol. You are going to have a heart attack. We've got to put you on a statin and you just have to stop that diet. And everybody who works in this area will tell you this is really common. Um, so what we did with Kate is um, we sat down and we, we talked to her about, let's work out what your risk of having a heart attack really is. So we did a lipid subfractions, and you can see for Kate that she's got mo mostly large fluffy LDL. She's just got a little tiny bit of small dense LDL, 
but overall her particle size was large and she's in the low risk for coronary artery disease. I also spoke to her about CT coronary calcium scoring. So CT coronary calcium scoring has been around for 20 years but is really very poorly used. Basically it's a five minute examination where a CT scan of the chest so it's where the chest is done and we look at, we're looking for calcium in the heart or calcium in the coronary arteries. So what happens when coronary arteries are damaged, part of the, review, the repair process is about laying down calcium in the coronary arteries and you can pick that up on CT scan and there is a correlation between the amount of calcium in the coronary arteries and the risk of having a heart attack and also the risk of dying. So looking at the images on the screen, you can see this particular heart in the middle of the chest cavity, there is no calcium at all. And then moving over to the right, you can see there's a couple of little white dots of calcium there. So that calcium score is 48. Uh, down here, you can see there's increasing amount of calcium in the, in the coronary arteries. That calcium score is 203. And then finally, on, in the bottom here, you can see this person's got lots and lots of calcium in their coronary arteries, and that's a very high coronary calcium <coughs> score of 755. So the association between coronary calcium score and risk of heart attack is really clear in the science. Um, I think all cardiologists accept that it's a, a reasonable test to do. So if we have a look at uh, the um, incidence of um, coronary events, incidence of heart attacks over a period of five years, and we've divided the coronary calcium score up into four. So the lowest one in the orange bar is a coronary calcium score of zero, and you can see at five years there's almost no risk at all of having a heart attack. Um, and as the coronary calcium score increases, the risk of having a heart attack increases, so that for someone with a coronary calcium score of over 300, their risk at five years is around about 10%. Similarly with mortality, this is a, quite a large study of 25,000 people, again um, looking at uh, the follow-up over 12 years and the percentage likelihood that you'll be alive at the end of 12 years. So again we've got the minimum coronary calcium score at the top which is 0 to 10 and you can see that 99.4% of people with a low coronary calcium score will survive uh, the 12 years, but as the coronary calcium score increases, you'll see that the chance of dying increases. So by the time you've got a coronary calcium score of over 1,000, you've got about a 23% chance of not surviving the 12 years. So we did a coronary calcium score on Kate, and her level came back at 13.1. So again, lots of information. How do you put that together in some way so that Kate could understand what her risk actually was? So we used a cardiovascular risk calculator. There's lots of those around. I like to use the MESA cardiovascular risk calculator, which is the multi-ethnic study of atherosclerosis, available online for any of you who want to use it for yourself. And essentially you put in all of the details about Kate, so her age, her coronary artery calcium score, whether she has diabetes, does she smoke, does she have a family history of heart disease, uh, what her parameters are, total cholesterol, HDL cholesterol and systolic blood pressure and also what medication she's on and we come out for a 10 year risk of having a cardiac event and her 10 year risk is 2.5%. So out of 100 people over 10 years, Kate's got a 2.5% chance of having an event. So 2.5 people over uh, uh, 10 years are going to have a cardiac event. So what if we put her on a statin? So if you look at the uh, most convincing statin studies for primary prevention that uh, putting, it, putting someone on a statin for primary prevention to prevent their first heart attack will reduce the risk by about a third. So let's be generous and take one person away. So we've now decreased the risk to one and a half percent. But the problem with uh, statins is that statins increase the risk of diabetes. And this isn't well known at all. It's not publicised, but it's uh, um, really well confirmed in the literature. So this is actually a huge study from Korea. It's a million people, so 500,000 people on a statin and 500,000 people not on a statin, looking at the cumulative incidence of type 2 diabetes over time. And you can see that the red line is the patients on a statin and the blue line is the patients not on a statin. And as you can see, as time goes by, the people on a statin have a much higher incidence of type 2 diabetes. So if you want to quantify that, the minimum risk associated with being on a statin is probably about a 40% increased risk of type 2 diabetes, so a 1.4 times increased chance of diabetes. But for patients who are on statins for long periods of time, for 10 plus years, and especially if they're on high doses, that risk goes up to about two and a half fold. 
Statins also uh, increase insulin resistance, they increase insulin, and they make diabetes more difficult to control. So how does that equate to Kate? So she's now got a one in 100 risk of developing diabetes if she goes on the statin, uh, and a one in 100 risk of preventing a, a, a myocardial infarction if she goes on a statin. So let's put that together. So out of 100 people in Kate's risk group who go on a statin, one person will prevent a non-fatal heart attack, and one person will get type 2 diabetes as a result of being on a statin. So we put all this information to Kate, and she said, nah. I don't want to go on a statin. Mm -hmm. um, so Kate was able to make, make a decision for herself. She was able to take the coronary calcium score back to her GP to try and reassure her GP. So um, I'm going to conclude there and just say that I'm, I know that's a lot of information in a really short period of time. So what we're going to do is we're going to upload this talk on our Facebook page tomorrow. So if you want to follow us on Facebook, you'll get a link to this talk. Um, and I work with Low Carb Keto Health with Nicole Moore, dietitian, who's going to talk to you later, and also with Jodie Bunn, who's our health coach and business manager, and we'll be around all day. And if you'd like to come up and talk to us, we'd be really happy to talk to us. Mm -hmm. So thanks very much.